So here we are at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem where tradition holds Jesus was buried and rose from the dead. Now in order for there to be a resurrection from the dead, we must first establish that Jesus died by crucifixion. There are facts concerning the death of Jesus, both biblical and non-biblical sources that helps our case. Non-Christian sources like the Jewish Talmud or Josephus or Tacitus and Lucian affirms his death. And then you have Christian sources like the New Testament, oral tradition and early creeds I'm talking early creeds before the Nicene Creed, such as 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 3 through 7, verify Jesus' death by crucifixion, including Jesus' early followers. They went to their graves for advocating a Messiah who rose from the dead. There are at least six historical facts that most scholars agree upon. Fact number one, following the crucifixion of Jesus, his body was placed in the personal tomb purchased by Sanhedrin's own Joseph of Arimathea. Fact number two, on the third day, a group of Jesus' women followers discovered the tomb empty. Fact number three, there are many recorded appearances of Jesus appearing alive after death. These post-resurrection appearances include not just his disciples or early followers experiencing Christ alive from the dead, but also skeptics and enemies of Christianity testify to these post-resurrection appearances. Fact number four, we know from biblical and non-biblical sources that the disciples of Jesus sincerely believed that Jesus had risen from the dead and they paid with their lives for, for this belief. Fact number five, we know that Christianity arose immediately following the crucifixion of Jesus. But where did this idea of resurrection come from? What birthed Christianity? What launched the new faith in Jerusalem? This resurrection belief was different from that of the Sadducees. The Sadducees, you see, they denied miracles and resurrections. The Pharisaic and the common Jewish belief in the first century was that of a general resurrection in the end, at the end of time. But a literal messianic rising from the dead was something unheard of in Jewish thought. Fact number six, the early and immediate followers of Jesus began to preach a resurrected Christ, which ultimately led to their deaths. As the eminent New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, it's hard to explain the rise of Christianity unless Christ rose from the dead. The very fact that it came on the scene so suddenly and people gave their lives for that very belief, claiming that they had experienced him from the dead for 40 days is the best explanation for the empty tomb. In order for there to be a resurrection, we must first establish that Jesus died by crucifixion. We have non-Christian sources affirming his death on the cross. We have the Talmud, Josephus, and Tacitus, including Lucian, who all state that he died on a Roman cross. We also have early biblical sources like oral tradition, the New Testament, and very early creeds, not to mention the disciples, the eyewitnesses to his death and resurrection, all affirming that he died on the cross and rose three days later. Well, I think the strongest argument for me is the fact that Jesus absolutely changed the whole nature of his disciples with the resurrection. Up till that point, they're doubting, they're hesitant, they're fearful. Uh, Peter denies him. Judas, of course, betrays him. All of them flee. Only John shows up at the cross. Now think of that. You've invested yourself in these men for three years and only one guy dares to show up while you're being executed on the cross. Uh, they are convinced that it's over, that Jesus is dead. There is no hope for the future. They're in hiding. Uh, you've got eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts. Over 500 people saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. Contemporaries of the events wrote nine, book, uh, nine people writing 27 books, uh, recording over 500 people who saw Jesus after his resurrection and who saw an empty tomb, who touched his hands, put their hand in his side, ate with him on four occasions, saw the empty tomb, saw the empty uh, grave, grave clothes, and turned the world upside down saying, kill me if you want, but I know it's true. The assumption that the body of Christ was merely taken down from the cross and uh, thrown in the trash pile and devoured by dogs, 
uh, is not based on anything in the Gospels, certainly, and is not based on any real historical evidence of any kind, other than the fact that <clears throat> that is what often happened with Roman crucifixions. The body was so badly mutilated by the end of the crucifixion that if there was not a family there to take the body, claim the body, bury the body, then the criminal who had been crucified would be simply tossed aside. Uh, and the body would either rot or be devoured by scavengers. So <clears throat> some liberal theologians then try to speculate, well, this is perhaps what happened to the body of Jesus. There's not one shred of evidence for that, not one indication anywhere in any of the gospel records uh, that that kind of thing ever took place at, at all. The family is there at the cross. Uh, they are concerned about the body. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea comes forth to say, I'm willing to have the body buried in my own private tomb. Uh, that would have eliminated the possibility of it simply being devoured by wild animals. It is highly unlikely that uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, would have allowed that to happen, that John the disciple would have allowed that to happen. Uh, you get the impression from the gospel record that at the end of the crucifixion, everybody wants to get out of there uh, quickly. The Passover is coming. Uh, and uh, it's Shabbat Eve and uh, even the Roman soldiers after all of the trauma that has taken place at the cross uh, want to leave this place. Uh, they're not going to simply toss the body aside, run off and let the family, well they'd run in and gather the body up if that happened. There are a lot of aberrant views on the uh, resurrection. Uh, some say that uh, Jesus was raised in a spiritual body, an immaterial body, but they're well, I'm misinterpreting 1 Corinthians 15 because spiritual body, spiritual there, pneumaticos, is a, an adjective and body soma is a noun. Every time the word soma, body, is used in the New Testament it always refers to a physical body when it's used of an individual human being. Now why was it called a spiritual body? It's a spirit dominated body. It's a body that's dominated by the spirit, but it was a physical body. In 1 Corinthians 15, where that occurs, the same author, Paul, uses that same word of spiritual food, the manna. It was physical food, but it had a supernatural source. He uses that same word uh, of the spiritual rock that followed. It was a literal rock that they struck, Moses struck, and water uh, came out. So the, the word does not mean immaterial. It means a spirit-dominated physical uh, body. So that's one mistake. The other mistake they make is uh, there are people who say that his body was really annihilated and then it was replaced by theophanies that gave the uh, appearances. His body wasn't annihilated. It's, he said in John chapter 2, uh, destroy this temple, his body, and in three days I will raise it up again. The same body that was destroyed is the body that came back. Why an empty tomb uh, if it wasn't the same body? Why scars? You know, he showed him the scars, the stigmata from the crucifixion. So these views uh, are directly contrary to the facts of the Gospels. Only God can raise himself from the dead. So there we have a picture of a divine Messiah physically rising from the dead, being spiritually conscious in doing so, refutes the idea of annihilation after death, as some theologians are teaching, and it also implies a divine Messiah.